We're going to be hearing from the Word of God from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. So would you turn there if you have a Bible? And if not, you could look on our screen, catch with us. Uh, But we'll be hearing from Hebrews chapter 4 today. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, we're reading from this passage, for it's the Sunday that will remember the ascension of Christ. And here, the author of Hebrews tells us the significance of his ascension. And here, the author of Hebrews writes, for all God's people, let us give our full attention. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Amen. Church, join me in prayer. Uh, We need a miracle to hear his word well today, and that's what we're going to get as we pray. So let's pray together. Lord God, we come to your scriptures with hearts opened and hungry. Lord, to not only hear from you and understand and live life well, but God, also to know you. Lord, there is this secret all throughout Hebrews of drawing near to you. Open to us now because of Christ, who is even now at your right hand. Lord, we thank you that Our prayers do not come to you as distant messages from a faraway land, but God, your spirit is now even even this very morning in us and amongst us. That God, you are nearer to us than even our own family or any other person in the world. And God, right now we pray, as your word is preached, God, would you grant clarity to us who are oftentimes ignorant and distracted? Or would you speak powerfully into our hearts that we might believe and be encouraged. And oh Lord God, more than anything else, Father, may we look nowhere else for salvation and hope and life than in you. And God, in Christ, Father, we want to be drawing near even now in the preaching of your word. Oh Lord God, thank you for these wonderful gifts. And God, we pray and we thank you for the word. And now do your work amongst us powerfully, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today, as I mentioned, is uh, Ascension Sunday. And ascension is kind of a word we don't tend to use too often. It feels like a very churchy word. But what it remembers, at least the Sunday we remember, is that after the resurrection, Jesus Christ appeared to his disciples and to a multitude of people. And after that time, he ascended into the sky. It's a pretty uh, sort of crazy special effects thing that happened. And the disciples were near. And after he was done, about 40 days later, he started just going into the sky. (laughs) And eventually, as disciples are looking up, you know, if you ever see a balloon that go, and you're just trying to watch as long as you can, like, I wonder what I'm going to lose sight of it. And eventually, it's just sort of gone out of vision. Your eyes are not strong enough to see it. Well, the disciples are looking, and he's gone. And eventually, an angel shows up. It's like, what are you looking for? You're not going to keep seeing him. He's gone, right? Get on to business. Get on to your ministry. Get on to discipleship. Do what he tells you to do. And, and this is what we celebrate. The ascension is, is, is not just the conclusion of a story. It's not just sort of, now he's gone, and there we go, the story is done. The ascension actually has tremendous significance for Christian life. In fact, the Bible kind of puts it this way. It's Jesus, you know, he describes his ascension in John and, and the significance of it in multiple different ways. He basically says it's better that he is gone than that he's here. It's better for us that he's physically absent from the church than if he was actually here amongst us and locally available. It's better for us, and it's better for us in a few different ways. But today, what we're going to focus on is it's better for us because Christ fulfills a priestly role for us through his ascension, that he serves as our high priest perpetually, precisely because he is gone and he's now with God in heaven. And what I want to point out in our passage as an encouragement to us, hopefully at the end of the the sermon, as, as you reflect upon the meaning of it, as you pray and you think about it, the end result is actually you come to God more often. You come to God more freely. You have a deeper and more vital relationship with him because you feel less inhibited and less guilty and less 
trodden down by your own conscience and your own feeling of failure, but rather that you come to God boldly and that you access him and that you benefit from him often, daily, always. And what I want to point out is, are, are three things here. First, the event that's being alluded to here. What, what actually occurred? Secondly, the significance. Why did it matter? What did it mean for us? And then finally, third, the benefit. How do we, as Christians, then prosper because of that? What, what difference does it make in life? What do we do as a result of what Christ is now doing in heaven? So the event, the significance, and then finally, the, the benefit. The event is going to be the shortest part because I already pretty much spoiled it for you, right? It's like Avengers Endgame. Spoiler alert. It's the, what it was was the ascension. In verse 14, if you recognize here, uh, the author of Hebrews says this. He says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. The encouragement there is that Christians would not give up on their Christian life. That was a great threat in the early church. There were these Christians, at least they looked like Christians, they professed Christ, that eventually wandered away from the faith, who apostatized. They, they left the church and then ended up sort of showing themselves to be not really of God. Church has that a lot of times. There are people that are with you for a while, that get into your fellowship, that eat with you, that celebrate, sometimes sing songs with you, but eventually they leave. And the early church had to consider what happens to those people? And as this is occurring, there's an encouragement. You know, it's explained to some degree in Hebrews what's going on there. But the encouragement is you don't fall away, though. You got to fight. You got to persist in the salvation that God has granted to you. You got you to pursue it all the way to the end. And that's why he says, because we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, the encouragement there is let us hold fast our confession. And the end of the passage that I read, the way that we hold fast our confession is by the grace of God. That in our time of need, in our time of testing, when we suffer, we need help. We're not going to make it on our own strength. And so when we need that help, it's available to us by God, but only if we draw near and, and seek it out. And so here's, here's the, the point. What the author is connecting here with our access to God, with this saving access is the ascension of Christ. He says that Christ, our high priest, has passed through the heavens. And, and the Bible makes clear what that is referring to. Jesus having left the earth, I mean, he, he talks about this all throughout John. Having left the earth, he resumes his place of heavenly glory. And now he is seated at God's right hand as one who would govern all the universe according to his will and to his good pleasure for God's glory and yet as the text will point out to us, and yet sympathetic to us, mindful of our feelings, mindful of how we experience life, knowing our weaknesses. You see, Jesus didn't rise from the grave in order to enter your heart. He didn't just sort of do like a Final Fantasy dispersal or like a, you know, a fade out into just memory. He physically, body and soul, left. Now that matters. He rose from the grave to be returned to absolute glory. And the primary significance of it, the primary sort of meaning of it, to be seated at God's right hand, to be on that throne of grace, really means he's now in charge. He's executing God's will. He's the, he's the XO of all creation. He does what God the Father has willed. And he governs all providence now by his great power and his authority. It means also for the church the coming of the Holy Spirit, the expansion of mission to be a prerogative of every believer and not just localized to a single place. That personal union with Christ through faith is, a, is available to every believer wherever you are. It's the opening of missions to all the world, to the Gentile nations. It's the concluding mark, sort of the, the enabling feature of God's whole plan for the universe and Christ left to accomplish it. But our focus today, the significant focus we're focusing on today is this. It's Christ's mediatorial work as our great high priest that we celebrate today, that, that lets us come to Christ so freely. Now, that's a lot of other words that you tend to hear in church but don't hear commonly. Mediatorial meaning, he actually, he's a go-between. He's a middle, middle person between us and God. He actually serves our interest to God and serves God's interest to us. He stands between us both and connects us in a much deeper way than we ever could have dreamed without him. 
The significance is that Christ reigns as a great high priest and he sympathizes with us. Consider verse 15 here. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who, in every respect, has been tempted as we are. And in Hebrews, temptation is connected with suffering. He's experienced all the kinds of sufferings that we have too, yet without sin. And for that reason, we can draw near to him. The author of Hebrews is connecting the ascension of Christ with the Old Testament priesthood. Now let me just fill you in a little bit what that was. So back in the day, when God freed Israel, took them to the wilderness to pass on to the promised land, and they screwed that up and they were wandering for a long time, there was a building up of a tabernacle, a layered cloth, 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 deeper, 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 intimacy, signifying the presence of God in the most holy of holies. And Israel as a camp would have the tabernacle situated right in the center. And always for Israel, the presence of God meant salvation and simultaneously threat, both. Salvation because God was their divine warrior. He would, he would drive out the peoples of Canaan and their enemies and he would win battles for them. He would save them, preserve them and feed them in the desert. He would care for them in every kind of way. He would ensure their survival only if he was with them. Yet at the same time, he was going to wipe them out at nearly every moment. Sin, as soon as Moses comes down the mountain and there's idolatry, rank, perverse, blasphemous worship, there is all kinds of complaining, hardness of heart, seeing the tremendous, miraculous grace of God and feeling, eh, has, maybe another God has some better tricks. I don't know how great that was. You know, we used to have meat and leeks and onions and all this kind of fish and food back in Egypt. Man, their gods were great. And in the midst of all the sin, this is the simultaneous threat constantly around Israel. Threat around their enemies. Without God, the enemies would destroy and crush them. The wilderness itself would consume them. And yet with God, they're under threat by God himself. Lose, lose. And so the tabernacle was erected, if you remember this, in order to regularly sort of provide a housing place for God that would not destroy the people, that was separated enough sort of symbolically and in some ways physically so that the people could have God with them yet not be destroyed. And the only way to do that was by the shedding of blood inside the tabernacle because there would be a kind of visual punishment for sin right in the middle of it. And so Aaron, their great high priest, who his line would continue on this work, would yearly come forward with sacrifices for himself to be cleansed, but also for the people. And as he would come forward, he would pass through those layers, pass through with burning coal, pass through with incense, and there would be smoke and cloudiness within the, the tabernacle. And he would pass through those curtains until he got to the Holy of Holies, where he would appease the wrath of God for sin. And in doing so, the people could breathe a sigh of relief. We have God's salvation and not his judgment. We have God's protection but not his dismissal. We have God's presence to save, but not God's presence to destroy for the year. Imagine for a moment, if you will, year by year as they're rehearsing this ritual, that God demands punishment for sin because he is a holy and just God who does not clear the guilty, yet he's also merciful. He's gracious, he's patient. Imagine the Israelite who would look forward to the Day of Atonement. They would see Aaron or one of his line take off their very fancy colored robes and put on simple white linen. He would take his tools, take the, the coals, the tongs, the incense, to see smoke coming beneath the tent curtains. You'd hear the braying and lowing of animals, the finest that your nation could find, to give to Yahweh. And it'd be rather silent otherwise. There'd be no talk. There'd be no things occurring within. There would just be business happening. The priest would be on his work. Eventually, as you see two goats enter, you would see one goat leave, run off into the wilderness. It was a scapegoat. You knew because you know, your parents and the people reminded you the two goats would go in and one would be slain, but the other would have the sins of the people 
pressed down upon its head and it would run away so far that no one could find it because it was a sign that your sins have left. They've been sent off never to return, that you are forgiven in the sight of God and he doesn't see you or consider you with any wrath any longer. And after a time, eventually, you'd see the priest exit. He would put on his old robes and the nation could continue. I have to imagine, the first week must have been magical to feel like you get a fresh start for the year. Whatever mistakes you've made, dishonest dealings with, with people in your community, uncharitable anger to your children and family members, disobedience to your parents, lying and dishonesty, sexual sins and fantasies, that all these things in just one momentous time of sacrifice is cleared away and runs off into the wilderness, never to be seen again, to die alone. But then you've got to imagine as a few weeks goes by and some sins start add, adding to the tally, as your habits and vices begin to take their old routines again and again. In fact, it almost looks like in some ways things just get worse. Your habits get worse. Your thoughts get worse. Six months, seven months, eight months to go by just thinking, when is, when is October coming? When is that sacrifice time coming? I, I'm feeling weighed down to have your prayers begin to start to die off, your offerings, your joy, your songs, to all begin to be emptied of life. You see, the point that the author of Hebrews is making is we have a high priest that's gone into the tent and has never come back out because his ministerial work as our priest goes on and on and on. The sacrifice is once and for all his death on the cross. That is the atoning work. That is the blood shed for the people's forgiveness. And that was sufficient. But his priestly work inside God's presence, and it's not just inside a tent in a holy of holies, it's in heaven itself. That he is with God and not for himself, but for us. You see, the whole nature of a priest, he's like the people, but he's also unlike them, isn't he? He's like the people in that he's one of their nation. He's also a sinner who needs forgiveness. He understands weakness. But he can go before God as one who is ordained. I'm not a priest because I don't serve that function. I pray for you. But the priest that we need, that's in, who is Christ, is one who is like us and yet stands to serve on our behalf in God's very presence. He does business with God and that business does not stop. And in fact, the, whole, the significance of the fact that he's been ascended to the throne that that throne of grace is not just one that, that God inhabits, but it's the Son of God who sits upon it. He has been granted to sit at God's right hand. Think about this. What ascended to heaven? Not a spirit, not a mere spirit, not a mere single nature. Human flesh rose up to come into God's presence. Human weakness now sits in control of all things. Christ has passed on into the heavens, not just for himself, but to consider here, Christ serves us perpetually. It's a blessing that Jesus is not here because where he is now, he serves us in far better capacity until his coming. The ministry is nonstop. Now finally, here's the blessing that's connected to it. That's the significance, but where does that make a difference in our life? The point here is clear. You can hold fast to your confession. You can walk that Christian life without being distracted or deterred. And you do that largely by coming and drawing near to God confidently, without hesitation, and that his grace and mercy is available to you in your time of need. The benefit here, look at verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one in whom in who every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can approach that throne of grace with great confidence because Christ knows how weak we are. That's, that's the teaching. 
We can come to him because he's not far away. He's not remote. He's not removed. There's a sense in which the one who sits in heaven is closer to us than even our closest friends. He understands our weakness. I want to point something out here. Christ was tempted like us in every way. That doesn't mean he knows what it's like to be married. It doesn't mean that he's had children and he's had to be patient with them. It doesn't mean that he's gone through every kind of sort of manifestation of temptation. But that means in all the kind of ways in which suffering produces sort of, it shows our weakness and our propensity to turn to things that are not God. How challenge brings out our true nature that we can't hide sometimes when things are going well. Hebrews 2 talks about how Christ, when he was tempted, suffered To be tested meant he was constantly pressed to his limits as a human, to see who he really was, and he never sinned. Now, what benefit does that have to us? You know, the whole sort of theme that you see in Hebrews is there's this temptation in worship to choose things closer to us and further from God to worship angels instead of Jesus, to look to Moses instead of Christ, who is our mediator, to continue on hoping in priestly work and sacrifice instead of Christ, who is our great high priest. And the whole temptation is really obvious to us because we do the exact same thing. God feels far away, holy, remote, inaccessible, too transcendent to be of any use to us. So we want something closer, something spiritual but not quite divine, something that can be a a, a looking point for our faith that isn't quite God and invisible and without any image, maybe something like Moses, some rule-giving that might help us to really be practical about Christian faith. And our temptation is always to settle lower than Jesus. What the author of Hebrews is saying is, look, Jesus is actually closer to you than any substitute you can find. He's closer to you than Moses. He's closer to you than Aaron. In a way, he's closer to you than the angels. Precisely because he is like you, tempted as we are, yet without sin. And for that reason, as the author of Hebrews points out, able to sympathize. You know, I oftentimes think the older I get, the more difficult it becomes to sympathize with people that are younger than myself. Uh, That's true with children. I just sort of see them as these magical creatures with their own rule system. But I find it especially true with college students. With college students and those briefly out of college, I find myself harboring a tremendous amount of unfair judgment. Uh, Let me explain the sin first, or the the, the judgmentalism, I guess. You know, I'll see some things about like schedule stuff or about, you know, how you complain about too much stuff to do or how you spend your money and all that kind of stuff. And I start to think to myself, how how dare you live this way? (laughs) Like, this is an affront to the sacrifice of your parents. You know, it's a mismanagement of of your time and opportunity. And I have all this kind of self-righteousness. And then all it takes is my wife to say, do you remember when you were in college? And I think that was a dark time of my life that God has forgiven and I've moved past that and I'm a different person now. And it's not the same situation. And I think to myself, well, let me think about when I was in college. I had no idea how credit cards worked, but I had one. And so I just bought a lot of stuff. I didn't, I actually, like, this is a true confession. I did not know how interest worked. I didn't know that when you use a credit card, you actually had to pay more at the end. I didn't know about that. So I was just thinking, this is just money, and eventually things work out, and I'll make money and pay this back. I had no idea of things like annual percentage rates. I just, I didn't know how any of that worked. So I would take you know, people on these little dates. I thought they were dates. They thought it was just us hanging out as friends, but you know, I justified in my mind. I paid the bill, so it's a date, right? Like, that's fair. And I'd be like, yeah, let's go to Claim Jumper. Sure, get the drink, you know, like, get dessert. We'll do it all. We'll watch a movie afterwards. And, uh, and just blowing money. And I, I never studied. I, I was unfaithful in a lot of things I was responsible for. I was, I was a pretty horrible person. If I was in my own church, I'd be immediately under discipline for, for just profligate living and just stupidity. Uh, but I have forgotten that because I'm now 38. And now I look at college students just not understanding how you can be who you are. Like, like Michael Scott, like, I hate so much of the things you choose to be. I just, I don't understand anymore, right? You know the reason why? is because after time creates some distance, at least for me, and I think for a lot of us, There's no more sympathy. And here's the thing. 
a lot of the things that young people do is still foolish and destructive and harmful and sinful. But what I forget is what I, f- I forget what it's like to be weaker. I forget what it's like to be a teenager and just have hormones and emotions and not be able to be in control. I had nieces living with me, just young teenagers, and I questioned to myself. So either these particular kids are sociopathic, or or they're just unrepentant, unregenerate sinners, or they're or they must be just ignorant beyond belief because this this could not be justified in human form. But then I forget, dude. When I was 15. I was a, a miserable, sinful, lust-driven, and and really weird kid, like really weird. And I forget that. And here's here's the point I'm making. Christ knows constantly what it's like to be weak, little old you. And would you notice this? He not only recognizes the the difficulty of the circumstances we are born into, which he certainly understands that. He understands how hard it is to conform your will to the Father's and to the law that you don't yet love. He understands what it's like to have that human frailty, to suffer finitude, limited time, lack of knowledge. But not only that, but he he knows what it's like to be weak. And I think that's what we sometimes need the most sympathy in, because sometimes we have perfect circumstances. Sometimes we have all the right context to succeed and do well, but we are weak. We just get distracted. We don't want what's good for us. And that times, at times, is the most humiliating and shameful. Is I had every reason to do well with this, to obey. I didn't do it though. I chose not to. And、the author of Hebrews was encouraging us to say, "Look, Jesus is not far remote and severe to look at your behavior and just with disdain and contempt look at you and say, 'How could you be so weak?' He actually, in the weak veil of human flesh, himself looks and has sympathies. I understand. I get it. It's not excusing it." It's not promoting further disobedience and failure, but the heart attitude towards us is not one of judgment and disdain.、It's、sympathy. He feels what it's like to be young. He knows what it's like to be single. He's been disappointed by relationships. He's had people that ought to have been role models in his life turn out to be the ones who betrayed him. He gets what it's like to be sick and know that death is around the corner. You see, he doesn't just sort of have it as a memory, but the fact that he is there now in heaven as a human. It means he lives perpetually, living in the midst of our experience of human frailty, yet in divine glory, never to die, never having sinned. And so, not only is he perfectly fit to be our high priest, but he's one who's fit to not be overly judgmental in relationship to us. You see, the, the next couple of verses here, verse two, chapter five, he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. You notice that it's not that he was beset with weakness; he is beset with weakness because he is now in human nature. That he is the God Man, both God and man in one person. That the human nature will always be less than the God nature. So he knows. Now, why is that such a, a blessing to us?、Um, it means that we have access to mercy and grace in time of need. You know, in Hebrews,、uh, the phrase "drawing near to God" is repeated again and again. It's, it's used over and over. And what's surprising is it's oftentimes connected to the idea of salvation. Uh, let me read you just a few verses here, Hebrews seven nineteen, speaking of Christ being superior to the law, to the Old Testament ways. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God. Chapter seven, verse twenty five, just a few verses later. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And since we have this confidence. We must draw near. You see, the, let me actually just one, one more verse. There's a couple more here, but、uh, 
Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. It's linking it again and again, right? The conclusion of salvation, to run the race well, to hold fast your confession, to have grace in time of need. How do you get that? It's by drawing near to God with a clear conscience through Christ, who is the veil, who's the entranceway. When you trust in him, that his cleansing blood has atoned for your sins, you actually come to God. You're no longer fearful. And this is one area, like in a sermon, it's not super practical where I can just give you to-do lists and so now this changes your workplace. And it's, a, it's an internal apprehension of how God feels about you and what you should do about it. Uh, you know, it's a season where like fruit flies are starting to come back to my house and there are these annoying little things that are floating, always flying on the periphery. I look at it and it's gone and I can never get these stinking fruit, fruit flies, right? But they're also too much of a hassle to go and kill. And I oftentimes wonder if we start to think of ourselves like the fruit flies in God's house. We're a little bit too much of a nuisance for him to now judge because well, I guess we're forgiven. But we just kind of buzz slightly annoyingly in his peripheral vision. And he's only going to serve us because in some ways he's obligated to. Because he's too busy to just crush us and put us out of our misery. We just need to sneak by. But in fact, the Bible gives us a tremendous invitation, an advantage that we can only enjoy in Christ. God has turned his attention directly to you because of Christ. And he delights in your coming to him. And I'm telling the worst sinner in this room who has been unrepentant, who spent months without confession, who maybe it's you know, your first time back in church for years, Every time a sinner comes to him, there is a gladness in his heart when he gets to meet with that person again. You know what's crazy? It's more bothersome for you to come to God than it is for God to have you come to him. What insanity is that? It causes you more pain to go to God than for God to have you come to him because in Christ, the blood spilt. The sins are gone. He wants his child back. And yes, that means if you've been wandering away in faith, there might be a right fatherly displeasure to your sin that he wants to lovingly correct and restore joy to your life. And yes, that means if you have neglected the means of grace, the means of, self, of discipline under his lordship and his life, there might be some pain in restoring broken bones, rehabilitating a dead soul, but it gets better. You see, there's an orientation in our minds, I think, when you think, you know, you ask a basic question. This very hour of Sunday, how does God feel about you? That you came into his church and that you're spending time thinking about him, listening to him, and hopefully praying to him. Mild annoyance? Does he breathe a kind of a sigh, like, it's been a while? Or in his heart, is he saying, ah, yes, finally, we can do this together. Finally, you've come. Because I've had grace for you. You've left it. You've left it unused. It might be the grace of discipline. It might be the grace of repentance. But it's grace for you. Finally, you've come to get it. I have more. You see, in Christ, we can approach the throne of grace to seek his mercy and grace, and we will not be rejected. We're not even going to be sort of handed it to the side. Because Christ, our mediator, serves us constantly at God's side, that means we're in. We're part of the family. Right now, at this very moment, ascended through the curtain in the presence of the Father, our great high priest bids us come. God always wants his children to come to him. He always wants his children to confess to him, always wants to forgive his children and bless them with a clean conscience, always wants to empower them and, and empower them to receive greater joy. He wants that. The only thing holding that back is our timidness to come. You can get that. You can come to him as you are. And let's just be clear, none of us are coming cleaned up on our own accord. We're all coming with baggage. We're all coming with failure. We're all coming with a track record that would not commend us. But how else can we come? And he's saying, come anyway, come now, right now. 
What are you waiting for? Do you have something better to do? Come on in. Let's wash up. Let's clean you up. Let's get you ready. Let's go. And this is God's heart for us. I want to encourage you. If there's one hope that you can leave here with today, may it be this. May it be that you can have a confident, almost a forceful entry into God's presence that you can say to yourself by the Holy Spirit's encouragement here, there's no reason to hold off. I can be confident to come to God, not because I can be flippant before his presence, not because it doesn't matter, but because of Jesus Christ, his work is concluded and his ministry as a mediator continues on even now. And he's interceding for you and he, he understands all the weakness and he wants you to come. Here now, as, as we finish this up, you know, brothers and sisters, uh, this comes out in the most practical ways. You will not run the race and finish unless God's presence becomes a thing desirable to your life as a means and source of grace to you, you're not going to finish the race without grace. And the only way to begin to even want that grace is to feel like it's accessible to you because of Jesus Christ. Do you feel that? Do you feel, even now, that because of Jesus, God wants to meet with you more than you want to meet with him, and he wants it even today? Let everything else that's going to come with that, the repentance, the confessions, the disciplines and things of life, let all that go later. Put that in the after. God will take care of it and he'll have you take care of it too. But the main thing that you have now in Christ is you have an advocate with the Father and now you can come free and as you are. None of you are withheld. All it takes is for you to come to trust in the Lord Jesus who died for you through his, through his flesh and through his death that you're now made right and perfect with the Father so that as far away as some lonely goat is from a city, <laughs> that's how far your sins are away. They're gone, and they're never coming back. Look to Jesus now, and right now, let's pray to him who is in heaven, seated and hearing us, and let's pray. Let's pray that we might come with confidence. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord Jesus, you even now are sitting and in your hand is a rod, a scepter, by which you rule all things. Your power is terrible in its greatness. You can do anything you now please. And yet, Lord, with human flesh, or with a soul that knows humanity, Lord, in knowing weakness itself, for Lord, in, in some sense, because you became one of us, you are weak. Yet, Lord, seated at God's right hand, you hold all power and dominion and authority. And in your omnipotent might, you sympathize with our weakness, yet rule for our, our good. Lord, forgive us for thinking you to be stingy with mercy, hesitant to give grace, when, Lord, we've seen the cost of your grace. Help us now, we pray, to come before you with great confidence. For, Lord, we know there are times coming where we shall be in need, where we will be tested, where our weakness will be exposed, where our sins will become unbearably heavy upon us. But, Lord Jesus Christ, we ask, point us once again to your white linen robes and the work you've completed and the bloodshed that now once and for all, Lord, we are forgiven. And we're invited now to come to be in the very presence of God himself. Lord, help us to not only know these things, but to live in light of them. Uh, let us pray more today than we did last Sunday. Lord, let us uh, be singing songs and, and worshiping in our heart to come to you in every way. Lord, because you have invited us. God, we give you thanks. And we pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.